just if you're a crafty person. So another chance to belong together and to be seen. And so that might be right up your alley, and, or s'mores and sing-along might be right up your alley, or both. So hopefully a chance to, to gather, connect, get to know each other more, and just have some fun fellowship next Saturday. Let's dismiss kiddos to go to their class with Miss Rachel today. So if you're four-ish, preschool age, up through fifth grade, off you go. Have a great class. We'll see you in a little bit. Some of you have noticed my attire, so I will say something that I think I've said once in the last 10 years. Congratulations, Washington State Cougars. (laughs) I did not lose a bet. I would not have bet on my Huskies this year, if we can call them that. What what an interesting year it is. And for some of you are like, wait, what happened? Apple Cup was yesterday? Um, Yeah, it was. So that's unusual. And maybe it wasn't. (laughs) Hard to say. But anyway, off we go. Um, Talking about hope, If we turn to politicians or to sports, we're in trouble, aren't we? No, at least for Seattle fans. We are in a journey here through Exodus, and even though we're in 33, 34, and if you have your Bibles, it's on page 73 and 74 in the the Bibles that are here in the room, and you're welcome to find that or use your own or a device. Even though we're in Exodus 33, 34, and if you see the full story, it goes through chapter 40, we're in the final couple messages, and you'll see why, because the, we've mentioned this, that there's a large section of repetition as the covenant is renewed, and we see that here, and we'll, we'll focus on it for a couple weeks, uh, but we'll kind of speed toward the end. And some of you are like, amen, and others are like, this has been a good a good slowdown to journey through this ancient story and really see the gospel on display. We saw it very clearly last week. We'll be reminded of it again today as we enter in. Let me just read a portion of Exodus 33. Where are we? Verse 15. Moses speaking to God upon the mountain. And Moses said to him, If your presence will not go with us, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor, grace, in your sight, I and your people, unless you'll go with us? In this way we shall be distinct, and really, in in only in this way will we be distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth. There's a snapshot of Moses' plea, which we looked at a little bit last week. The most important thing, the gospel, the good news is that God desires to be with his people. It's been evident from the very beginning, and it runs throughout the Scriptures. This is what the Scriptures speak of when we get into the New Testament or Greek, t- Greek Scriptures of the fullness of life, abundant life, and even salvation, sozo. This idea that we are only saved and find the fullness of life dwelling with God in communion with Him. That's the gospel. The means of the gospel is made possible ultimately in Christ. What He accomplished in His life, His incarnation and coming, all of it through the cross, through the grave, and through His resurrection. Moses didn't know that. He didn't know the full means of access to the dwelling with God, but he grasped the story. He grasped the gospel, that the most important thing The only thing that mattered was God's presence with them. He started to understand that, and there was this broken relationship after the people had responded in covenantal promise, yes, we will, God. We will be faithful to you, and you will come and dwell with us. They weren't. And now there's this division, this greater separation, and this wondering, is it all for naught? Will God not go with us? In fact, God said, I won't go with you. I would consume you. So I'll send an angel. I'll send you on. I'll be faithful to my my promises to you, but I will not go with you. And Moses is having none of that. So that's the only thing that matters. That's the only hope that we have 
is your presence. So he, Moses understands the gospel. He also understands that from the beginning, people have been distrusting God's promises, His presence, His pursuit of them, doubting Him and turning away from Him in a thousand different ways through action and attitude and often daily. And this is part of how we find ourselves in the story because we see that reality within our own lives, our own turning, dismissing, distrusting, sometimes daily. Moses also understands that the only hope that we have of God's dwelling with us, of God, of God being in full communion with us is His carrying of us, His carrying, bearing of our sin because we can't do it on our own. And this is what Moses has been pleading with God for. God, would you carry our sin, bear it? And God says here again, or Moses says here again, carry us up from here, right? Using that same language. So Moses understands that the only way for this to happen, for God to dwell with them, is for God to do it. So he relies on God's character. From his character comes his promise. So he's reminding God of his promises, not that God is forgetful, but God engages us at a level that we can engage with him. He reminds him of his character, his promise, and he relies on his name exclusively and desperately, who God has revealed himself to be, a God abounding in love, slow to anger, a God who is gracious, merciful, compassionate, and ultimately one who promises and desires to dwell with them. This is who God is, and Moses is depending on him for, for it to be faithful for His grace and compassion and love and glory to be known. We too can pray like this. God loves to answer this prayer. He loves to reveal His character and nature. That's also been evident through the story from the beginning. God is not a distant, aloof God. God is not a spiritual deity that needs to be awakened. God is a very active and pursuing God, desiring to make himself known, desiring his people to long to see his glory and his character. And this is what Moses asks for. So the Lord said to Moses, verse 17, I will do the very thing you've asked. Deep breath. For you have found favor in my sight. Basically, I will pour out my grace upon you. Not something Moses has done, something God chooses to do. For I know you by name. I know your heart. Right? He says, I know you, I see your character. Moses is asking to see him in his character and glory. God is saying, I see you. Maybe better than you see yourself. He probably says that to us now, today. I see you. So Moses says, show me your glory, I pray. So God's already answered all of his requests now. Crisis averted. God's presence will go. God says, I will do exactly what you've asked. By grace, by my grace. And Moses goes further. God, show me your glory. It's an interesting prayer because if we know the story, hasn't he already seen it? Moses has been meeting with God. He saw him at the bush. He heard his voice, maybe like no other in history. He's been, he meets with him in the, in the tent outside the camp. He's been up on the mountaintop 40 days. He's been as close as anyone. Hasn't he seen and experienced God's glory already? God, show me your glory. At minimum, because... I think there's some, some clarity to the answer, but at minimum, Moses is saying, there's more, God. I know that there's more. And in some way, that's always true. God is an infinite, eternal spirit. There's always more of him. But Moses recognizes they're all up to this point, there's still distance. There's still separation. God is coming nearer and nearer, making that possible. But Moses and all the people have still not experienced his fullness, his glory, 
which is one with his essence. We say, well, what, what does this mean? And hold this in mind. This is how we should respond today as we find our story in this story, inspired to pray as Moses prayed, convicted to see the people and the hearts of the people as we probably are, but to come, God, would you show us more of your glory? Could we experience you more deeply? Could we walk with you more completely? And I pray that we would, but that we would also recognize where separation and distance can still exist. For Moses, it did. He, he knew there was still distance. And we've seen through the story that part of that distance, that separation, was for protection of God's people. God's presence is powerful. And we've used the analogy like a consuming fire, some of the images even used. I know the youth leaders for you youth like to use the analogy, more modern analogy, of a nuclear reactor. Contained power, latent to do all kinds of good, but dangerous. You would take extreme caution to draw near, right? Putting on the right hazmat suit or protection to come near to that reactor. God's presence is kind of like that. A sense of, if I were to really draw near to you, I would consume you. Right? So there's right separation, protection, even in the tabernacle. Curtains, veils, altar, blood, process, procedure. It's for protection of God's people as, as much, if not more so, than the preparation of the hearts of God's people to draw near. It is both, but there is some sense of, of that distance. We've seen that throughout the story. Moses is here asking, God, show me all of your glory. May I enter fully into your presence? And some have said, Moses is recognizing that this might cost him his life at this point, and he's willing. It's worth it. It's not said in the story, but we wonder if Moses recognizes fully what he's asking. <laughs> God answers his prayer, but he still protects him. We'll see that as we continue. But Moses is asking for more, more closeness, more intimacy, more knowledge, more experience of God's presence and glory, and that's how we should rightly pray and respond. Would we? Do we really want to experience more of our holy God? Maybe, maybe not. First, how do we understand glory? That's a vast conversation throughout Scripture. So we'll just mention a few things today, kind of dip into it. I think there's some answer in God's response to Moses' prayer. Show me your glory. I want to experience more of you. This is verse 19, Exodus 33. God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and... I will proclaim before you my name, Yahweh. And then he goes on kind of expanding his name, as we see in many places in the Scriptures. My name, Yahweh, the one who is gracious to whoever I pour out my grace, the one who is merciful on whoever I pour out my mercy. In chapter 34, verse 5 and following, we see the fulfillment of this. So in 33, God says what he will do, I will make my goodness pass before you and proclaim my name. And then it comes to pass a little bit later. Chapter 34, verse 5. So the Lord came down in a cloud and stood with Moses. Some have said this is like a Christophany, the appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. That's not said in, in the Scripture, but any time that God makes Himself known in a human-like form, there's a sense of Jesus there on the mountain, in a cloud, in glory. However that was experienced by Moses, He passes in front of Moses, proclaiming His name, the Lord, the Lord, compassionate, and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, likely thousands of generations in this context, forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin. List three 
ways that we can turn from God, to be comprehensive of what God is carrying for them, who He is. Yet, He does not leave the guilty unpunished. Yes, it, God's glory is justice. And from right perspective, that is good when we see injustice and evil and oppression, that God will not forever withhold justice to fully come. That is part of His glory. And He will punish even children and their children for the sin of fathers to third and fourth generations. Without pressing too far into that, there are consequences, sometimes generationally so, for rejecting and turning away from God and taking a family away from the presence of God. There will be ongoing consequence. Now, we can't just read that without hearing right before it. First, God will pour out His grace and mercy to a thousand generations for those that turn to Him. So in an instant, that trajectory or legacy of a family can turn and change to find the character and grace and mercy of God. So we see in this encounter, in both God's Word and now the encounter, His glory is synonymous with His name. His glory is His goodness, the experience of pure goodness, and the declaration of His name. The announcing of the character of God is glorious. And certainly this isn't an exhaustive list of the character of God. It helps to understand, and we've seen this in the story often and throughout the study of Hebrew Scriptures, the Hebrew culture, a name was meant to be more synonymous with their identity and character. Often a name would be given later. Names would be changed to, be, to represent life change and character, more so than we might a little more flippantly name people today, name our children, although maybe not ultimately flippant, but often not with the idea of a prophetic or a character coming. So those were much more synonymous in that culture. And God's declaration, His proclamation of His name and His character is meant to be glorious. And so for thousands of years, God's people have sung His name, even as we're doing this morning, to proclaim His character because it's meant to be glory. The glory of God is in His name and character. To know God, to experience Him, to draw near to His person, His goodness, His grace, His patience, His abounding love, His faithfulness, His mercy, His forgiveness. This is to know and experience His glory, which leads to joy. You've probably heard me pray often, and it's been kind of a high value for us. God's glory is our joy. What I mean is this. As we experience His character, as we draw near to His presence, as we come to announce who He is, declare, proclaim who He is, that leads to joy. And joy is more than happiness, although it could be that. It's more than pleasure, although it could be that. The joy of the Lord is Above all, probably peace, shalom in the ancient, a sense of rightness, all is well, all is well. This is joy, contentedness, rest, peace and hope, the experience of love and care and nurture, being delighted in, all of this is joy in the presence and character of God. So this is what I mean when I pray, God, your glory is our joy. And we know that we barely scratch the surface of the depth. There's always more to the experience, to the knowing of God's glory and His presence. What an amazing encounter Moses has. And yet it's still veiled, isn't it? It's still restricted. Verse 20, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. Again, back to this idea of true closeness is 
dangerous to our very life, there must still be some protection, some some provision, some separation. So the Lord says, see, there's a place where you can stand over by the rock in this mountainside, this cleft of the cliff, stand here, face the rock, I will pass behind you, so very near, and then you can turn and see me as I pass. (laughs) This is a strange encounter, the glory of God's backside, and still majestic, and it reinforces the themes that we've seen throughout the story of God's of, of God's power in His very presence, just who He is. And so, God's care even then for Moses. He's the one in this encounter who will protect, hold Moses. His hands are upon him. Stand here, but you will experience more of me than you've experienced before because you've asked for it. God loves to answer this prayer. Any separation, any barrier, any veil is God's provision because God's desire is to be with us without veil, without separation. This encounter, all of these encounters, all of the, the curtain, the veil, the altar, the blood, everything about the rituals, the religion, all of it makes us, and this encounter itself makes us ask, will it always be like this? Is this the best we could hope for? Moses has reached the pinnacle. The Israelites didn't. They're still down in the camp, and that's us. But even then, if, that's the, if, we, could, if we could ever get up to the mountaintop, is that the best we could hope for? Will there always be separation? Will we never see God face to face? Will we never experience the fullness of His glory? We should, we should be asking these questions. Now, if you've read the rest of the book, the big book, you probably know those answers. What is the answer? We know it. It's Jesus. In this case, it is. It's not just the church answer. It's the amazing answer. Jesus has come to make, to eradicate the barrier, as Paul said in Ephesians 2. John, the gospel writer, clearly had this in mind. John 1, we've looked at this for a couple weeks in a row. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling, literally tabernacled amongst us. This is Jesus. And so now we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only. The glory of Yahweh is here in Christ. He's come from the Father and He's full of grace and truth, just as Yahweh. Remember Jesus said in John 14, 9, whoever has seen me has now seen the Father, has now seen God. The veil would be torn when Christ breathed his last upon the cross. The separation is fully removed. And as the story continues, the Spirit of God would descend and rest upon his people and ultimately fill them to dwell within them as new tabernacles, as living temples, both the church collective and even as individuals. We bear the presence of God with us. That's what we're intended for. That's the end of the story. That's the answer to the longing question, will there always be distance and separation? The answer is no, because of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit with us. Is this our experience? Is this our reality? And if not, why not? Perhaps we've been living distant from God, unknowingly, perhaps. A life trying to live under God, from God, for God, as we looked at last week, rather than living with Him first. And by starting from any other perspective, we keep distance. We we put the distance there when God doesn't intend there to be any Something that's perhaps more challenging to say, perhaps we don't want to be that close to the presence of God. Perhaps we don't want 
the glory of God, to dwell that near. We're fearful of what that might mean, of what that might do. Wouldn't the presence and glory of God close, that close, change everything? Shouldn't it? And if we start to recognize that, perhaps we say, no, thank you. Not that close. God, come near, but not that close. Because life is, life is hard, but it's okay. I know this life. I've grown accustomed to it. I'm somewhat in control of it. And that life, a life as clo- closer than Moses experienced, that seems totally out of control. I don't know what that would do. I don't know if I want to know what that would mean. What would it mean to lose passion for the things that I have passion for? Would I have to? I mentioned last week, I I love sports. It's both a joy and an escape. I love it. I don't think God is asking me to lay down sports. But if, if I draw near, fully near and dwell with the presence of God and experience his glory, will the love of sports and passion for sport lose its flavor? Will I have no taste for it? I don't want that change. I enjoy it. Sports can be a very neutral thing or it can be an idol, right? Just like so many other things. It's probably not sports for you. It's probably something else. But do you, do you resonate with that? That sense of, if I draw fully close, if God is fully that unrestricted within me and I experience his glory, would that change everything? This is the life that I know. Is it possible where we unknowingly live that way without confessing it, speaking it? Do we need to? Here's an unexpected parallel, perhaps. John 5, back to the Gospel of John. John 5, Jesus meets a man at a pool, a man who has been crippled and paralyzed, and here's the story. Maybe some of you know it, if not, hear it. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews, and there in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, was a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. There was this story of the the gods or the angels coming and stirring this water, and whoever could enter the water while it was being stirred would be physically, miraculously healed. That was the, the story of this place, this pool. So Jesus goes here while the blind and the lame and the paralyzed are there at this pool waiting, day over day. One who was there had been an invalid, paralyzed, for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for this long, he went up to him and he asked him, do you want to get well? And it seems like a ridiculous question, an astonishing question. For anyone at this pool was there for the very healing, miracle, only hope that they could have in that, in that condition in that time. And Jesus says, do you want to get well? If you you keep reading the rest of the story, the man actually doesn't say yes to that. He doesn't answer. He just says, I can't get into the pool. That'll be an interesting, another sermon from another day. I wonder how I preached on it when I went through John a few years back. But here it comes for us today. At least it came to me as I looked at this invitation, wondering invitation of drawing near to the glory and to the presence of God and Jesus asking, do you want to get well? And at first look, it seems ridiculous. Of course, 
I want your healing. I want your touch. I want your presence until we make it personal and ponder it and we say, maybe I don't because this is the life that I know. You know, there's an actual psychological disorder, either illness identity or illness fusion, identity fusion with illness, where those who have experienced long-suffering illness, chronic disease, even mental illness, see it as a core part of their identity. They can't, they can't see it otherwise. It's who, they, it's who they are. Their whole experiences and relationships and lens is, is through that. And, and the idea sometimes of getting well and being relieved of that can be unsettling or even terrifying because it's totally unknown. Even while saying, I, I, no, I do want to be healed, they are fearful of it and may, may come up short of even trying to find healing because it's all that they know. And I think anyone who's willing to engage that and try to make it personal, if that's not your story, can understand it, can recognize that. That over time, when we live in a certain way or, or condition for so long, it's simply what we know. It becomes what we think is a part of our identity when in reality it's not. It's something meant to be external to our true identity. And what if Jesus is asking us, do you want to get well? What if God is asking us, do you want to see my glory? Do you want to be that close? And we say, what kind of a question is that? We're here in church every Sunday. Well, not every Sunday. We pray all the time. Well, not all the time. We study our scriptures diligently every day. Well, not every day. We fast. Well, don't even start. And you know, if you've been, hopefully, under, under my teaching and other good teaching, I pray in this way it's good, that these, these behaviors, these spiritual behaviors don't lead to intimacy. They're meant to be a response of intimacy with God. Not a, we must so that, that's the life under God or from God that we were talking about last week. Though it's right, not a bad desire to be, say, God, I want to be more enthusiastic in my spiritual desires. Help me, Lord. That's a good prayer. But as we come back to that potential question, if God is asking us, do you want to be well? Do you want to be whole? Do you want to dwell with me? Do you want to experience my glory fully? Maybe not, because that's terrifying. What would that mean? Is that possible? How did Israel respond in this story? Okay, Moses comes down the mountain, 34 verse 29. After all this has happened, he has the new tablets. We skipped over that part. His face is radiant because he's met with God. He's experienced his glory. He's been that close. This is something new, apparently. And when Aaron and all the Israelites saw him and that his face was radiant, we don't, again, we don't know what that means. Some kind, of, some, kind of visu, some kind of glow. He's different. He's changed. They are terrified. <laughs> but I guess if his face actually was glowing, then yeah, it makes sense. I'm not sure if it was or if it was more spiritual. That some, something has been transformed within him. They're terrified. They don't, they don't even want to look on the reflection of the glory of God in Moses. They, they, they draw back from him. Moses says, no, come, come to me. Let me tell you what happened. And he spoke to them and he told them everything. And then after he had finished speaking, verse 33, he put a veil over his face. So in this interaction, God didn't say put a veil on your face. The people said, cover up. We can't look at you. But by their, either their fear or uncertainty, what they're saying is, good for you, Moses. I'm glad for you. That's, we need you. Be our representative, but don't come too close. We can't, even, we can't even look at the reflection of the glory of God. Why? Does it have anything to do with the, being that close means a change of everything? It's tragic. What if we do the same? Do you know anyone who just glows with the presence of God? My grandma Lois comes to mind. Many of you knew her past five years ago. She, when she was much younger and her kids were teenagers, they would, 
least as the story goes, some of the friends that would come over and get to know her called her the crazy Jesus lady. She's bizarre. She's just, she has an unnatural joy. It can't be real. It must be false. It must be fake. And maybe it was. I I don't think so. (laughs) I thought I was pretty close with my grandma, and I never saw it crack. But she was, she was odd. She was unnatural. And, and it felt like good for her, but I don't know if I want to be like her. People think she's crazy. Nobody's that happy and that joyous all the time. I do know that she walked with God and dwelt with him. And it's inspiring, but it's also convicting. And maybe you have people like that in your life that radiate with the joy of the Lord. I wish there were more. Shouldn't there be more? Shouldn't that be me? I want to walk with the Lord and dwell with him and experience his glory. Shouldn't it be seen? Isn't God's character, his nature, meant to radiate from us? His joy, his peace, his love, his patience, his kindness, his goodness. Oh, that starts to sound like the list of the fruit of the Spirit. Shouldn't those that commune with God that closely radiate in some way? Not all the same, not by any means. Shouldn't it somehow be visible? Probably not with a tangible glow, but where if you came into Grandma Lois's home, you'd say, I'm, I'm watching more closely now because that seems unnatural. How do you have it? How do you do it? Isn't that the kind of question that Peter says for all followers? We should be ready to answer that kind of question. He says it a little different, 1 Peter 2, 15. In your heart, set apart Christ as Lord and always be, it means an exclusiveness, a oneness, a purity of, of heart with the Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. See, in a world that didn't have hope, if we could relate, the people of Christ were to live in such a radiant hope that it was obvious that people would ask, where does that come from? How do you have that? Shouldn't that also be true of the other fruits of the Spirit, of the joy of the Lord, the goodness, kindness, patience? Shouldn't we radiate? And again, none of these things are things we choose or work harder at, right? That's not this message. That's not the gospel. Go now. Be more disciplined, work harder, be more faithful, be more pure so that you can radiate with all of these things and people will ask you and you can lead them to Christ. You heard that message? That's not the gospel. It's a false gospel. And we still struggle with it, don't we? Because the gospel is that God desires to dwell with us and he's done everything to make that possible. We are simply invited to draw near to his presence, to experience his glory, his delight, his grace, his forgiveness, for him to carry us, for his hands to be upon us as he desires, to protect us, to hold us, to show and reveal as much as we can handle. And from that encounter we live. From that place of joy and freedom, we go and be and do and may have conviction to change things in our life. I'm not saying we don't. I'm saying the order is vital. This is the hope of the gospel. And Christ has completed it. That the veil is torn, not just for access in, but for the Spirit out to us. So I'll say again, and I'll ask again, I'll ask myself, am I content living apart from God, keeping that distance just a little bit? Come close, God, but not, not too much. And if I ever really need you, I will ask, because I'm okay living life like this. I know it. I've come to be accustomed to it. I think as long as we want God also, we will keep distance. If we think life with God 
might be better, we will keep distant. We will remain apart. If we've become so accustomed with our identity in things or conditions that were never meant to be our identity, we will likely not rise up and walk or stand in the presence of God. Simple gestures requiring a little bit of faith is all that was being asked. And yet for some, we'd stay in our condition. And you might say, so if, if Jesus said this to the man, he didn't say it in the story, but I can imagine him saying, I'm an invalid, I'm a cripple, I cannot get to the water. And Jesus would say, wrong, no, you're not a cripple, you are not an invalid. That's a condition, your body has failed you. You are a child of God. You're a son of God, made in his image, delighted in, whose body is broken. And for you who have joined in, received the lies of the enemy that your identity is fear, anxiety, hurt, chronic pain, or anything associated with your career or things you do or status. It's no. Your identity is a child of God, made in the image of God pursued and loved, delighted over, meant to dwell with and experience the glory of God, and from that joy and that freedom to live. That's not at all saying that you don't or may not struggle with anxiety or addiction or anger or impatience and all of these things that we struggle with as humans. And this is not at all saying that this is an easy decision. Rise up and walk and go and be freed. May Jesus heal in an instant? He can, his prerogative. May it take years of therapy? Maybe. (laughs) Where gifts of healing are brought into our life and we walk in renewed freedom and hope and life in Christ. What if God is saying to us, what if Jesus is saying to us, arise? What if God is saying to us, stand here and my hands will be upon you? Receive and experience my glory, my son, my daughter, and live. I think that's his invitation for us, and I fully understand the hesitancy or the fear of taking that step, of walking into that place. It's a place of unknown for many of us. Some of us have known it, and it's been a long time because we've been living in our own abilities and strength for far too long. So as we respond, as we stand and sing, may they be our prayers. Maybe none of the words that are on the screen are ones that you actually say. Maybe they're your own prayers coming forward. Ultimately, God Help us to know your glory. God, will we experience more fully your presence as you come and move, as you stand and walk to receive communion? Jesus, is it possible that I could only hunger and thirst for you? I'm always inspired by A.W. Tozer's prayer after his first chapter in the famous Pursuit of God, a little book that he wrote really in one sitting I'd say that's an inspired kind of text, not in the same way of scriptures, but similar and through the Spirit, and I think it's gifted to the church. But his prayer is encouraging. For someone that so desperately longed to walk with God and to know him, his prayer at that end of that chapter was, God, help me want to want you. Help me thirst to thirst for you more. Even he recognized it's not enough. I I hold back. I step back. When Moses said, show me your glory, if he was willing to give his life and to have every, maybe his very life in breath, I'm not at that place of desperation. I don't even know if I want to pray for that kind of desperation. When Paul says to live is Christ, to die is gain. I desire to depart from this life and be with him. Well, yeah, he's in prison about to be executed by Nero. 
course he can pray that prayer. I can't pray that prayer. So wherever you are today, you are invited. The Spirit of God is inviting you to know him more. I know it. How will we respond to that? Make it personal? That's the invitation. Would you join me in prayer? And the team can come and lead us. God, we see in this story an amazing thing. And we can often just read the story and respond to it and say, that's so amazing that Moses got to experience that. But through Christ and the power of the Spirit, what you've said to us, what you've revealed to us is that we can encounter your glory even more greatly than Moses did. And for those that would say, that's never been my experience, then we are going to remind you of who you are. Show us your glory. And would you reveal to us the ways that we keep distant from you? For some of us, we're, able, we're going to be able to take that step today, a step of small faith that may feel big, Whatever that means, you're inviting us. And for others of us, we can't yet. I pray for your help. We join in with the prayers of the saints like A.W. Tozer. Help us long to long for thee. Desire to be filled more fully by you. We thirst, but help us Become more thirsty still. May we dwell with you. Experience your delight. And regardless of how far we step today, may your sons and daughters know that you love them. That you're inviting them. That there's delight upon your face as you see them. Help us see ourselves as you see us. For those that are wrestling with things that are not their identity, but they sense is just all they know. Lord, we want to break those lies, the lies of the enemy that would keep them in bondage. That they could live in your joy and love and grace and delight and see how you see them. And there be whole. For you are worthy, and God, your glory is our joy. Amen. Amen. All right, kids coming back to be with us as we sing, as we take communion. The elements are there and ready for us. Respond as you feel led, as the Spirit invites you. Amen. Amen.